Well, good evening, everybody. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews tonight. Launching off into a, a brand new book study. We're very excited uh, about that. As you're turning there, uh, the most interesting thing about Hebrews is, as opposed to the other books of the Bible, that especially the New Testament, that we're uh, fond of reading, particularly the epistles, the letters, there's no designation given as to who wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, there's all kinds of speculation about this, and it goes all the way back almost to the beginning. Uh, Clement of Rome uh, felt that it was the Apostle Paul who wrote it. Uh, but uh, again, points of view changed over time. You get into the Reformation, you've got people like Martin Luther who would uh, tell you is absolutely certain that Apollos, uh, a man who was mighty in the Word, who understood the Old Testament backwards and forwards, uh, was the author. Uh, John Calvin uh, thought that it was uh, Paul, but uh, the, the speculation goes on. Uh, I guess the safest place to land would be with uh, what the uh, early church official origin said about the book of Hebrews. Only God knows who wrote Hebrews. But generally speaking, one of the reasons that uh, people wonder if Paul was the actual writer of it is because the, the way the language flows and the style, very different than some of the letters that uh, are associated with the Apostle Paul. Of course, there's a possible reason for that. Uh, the other letters that Paul wrote were largely for a Gentile audience. And so uh, he would write in a different way, probably, I guess we would say, in a more rabbinic way uh, to a Jewish audience than he would uh, a, a, Je a Gentile or a mixed Jew and Gentile uh, audience. Uh, other people believe that uh, it may have been Paul writing in Hebrew, but Luke translating it into Greek, and that's why we see some of the changes in the language there. Uh, it's interesting to note that the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews can be pretty well established. It was definitely before the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, because uh, the idea of temple worship is still very much in focus in the book of Hebrews. So if the temple had been destroyed, really there would have been no reason to talk about uh, any kind of uh, temple rituals or the significance of it all, or even the danger of going back to temple worship. It wouldn't have existed. Uh, and, and so most uh, commentators believe that it was written sometime the mid-60s is usually where uh, the writing of Hebrews is placed. Uh, the rub that comes up with Hebrews is because of the uncertainty of the authorship. Uh, there are those who will say, well, you know, how can we really know that it was the Word of God? Doesn't every New Testament book have to pass the test of have being written by an apostle or a direct associate of an apostle? Well, if it was the Apostle Paul, you know, problem solved. With someone like uh, Apollos, he was definitely an associate, so it's really kind of a non-starter. Uh, the uh, interesting thing about the book of Hebrews is this, and, and it touches on a live issue in our day and age. Uh, there are over 29 direct Old Testament references that you'll find in 13 chapters of the book of Hebrews. But wait a minute, uh, there's more. There are another 53 Old Testament allusions, that is, references to scriptures, even though they aren't quoted. So when you read the book of Hebrews in 13 chapters, you make a journey to the Old Testament no less than 83 different times. Now, the reason I bring this up is that there are some in evangelical circles with major ministries who believe that we need to uncouple our faith as New Testament believers, from the Old Testament. That the Old Testament really has nothing to say to us as believers, and all that's going to do is get you bogged down in a legalistic swamp. Well, evidently, the writer of Hebrews didn't get that memo because he is all over uh, the Old Testament. And uh, as we often exhort you here, don't go through your Christian life with half a Bible or really even a third of the Bible, the way the, the percentages break down. All 66 books that we have that compose our Bible 
the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that all Scripture, and, and the language there is really vivid, it says all, literally each and every Scripture, is inspired by God. It is just as much God's Word as if we were standing in the presence of God, hearing Him speak, and be even close enough to feel His breath as He parsed out the words. It's God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So if you want to decouple your faith from the Old Testament, remember when Paul used the word Scripture there, he was largely referring to what we would call the Old Testament. So if you're in a place where you don't need any more teaching, no more correction, no more reproof, no more training in righteousness, if you feel like you're already equipped for every good work, the Old Testament has nothing to say to you. You can just move on. But for the rest of us, <laughs> I think it's a real good reminder that there are just precious gems and jewels that God has for us all the way through his word. Uh, you know, it's been said it's all about Jesus, and we're going to see that that's a huge theme that comes up in the book of Hebrews, won't we? Yeah, absolutely. And it's important before we get into it to also uh, understand not only when it was written and the setting, but why it was written. Uh, Scott's already alluded to the fact that there was kind of a, a mass apostasy happening at this time. That there was a lot of Jewish believers who were leaving the faith. They were leaving Christianity, not really because they were being convinced by some really amazing theological argument, not because they were being entranced by skeptics. Uh, it was actually largely because they missed the old system. They missed the temple. Right. They missed the worship. They missed their friends and their family. Tradition. <laughs> the <Yeah. laughs> traditions yeah. and everything. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it sounds kind of radical, but, I mean, imagine if coming to Christianity, those people who come to Christianity, usually from more cultic groups nowadays, will probably understand this a little bit better than those of us who grew up even in atheistic homes or in Christian homes. But it really was, for them, leaving their old Jewish roots was to be labeled like you're in a cult and that you were ostracized from friends and family. You weren't allowed to go to the synagogue anymore. You weren't allowed to go to the temple anymore. You couldn't participate in the feast days. No more holidays for you. You can't do any of the things that you used to do. And it, usually it would lead to you losing your job, uh, your, your reputation. And we even see later on in the book, heavy persecution. Even in imprisonment. That's, That's right. Imprisonment and uh, people plundering your goods, right? Taking your stuff because you're one of those Christians and you don't deserve things. Uh, so we, we see uh, a lot of this, uh, this pressure from the outside and the inside driving people to Judaism. And so this book is what we call largely apologetic, and uh, meaning that it is a book that is designed to defend our hope, right? Defend the hope that we have in Jesus. Why is Jesus so great? Yeah. Why is yeah. he worth losing all these things and still be worthy no matter what? Uh, what are we gaining in Christ that the law could never give to us? And because of that, it's going to be really systematic, which is why I like it. It kind of is like a, it's like a Romans type book. Uh, those of you guys who have read Romans, you understand what I'm saying, that when you read through the book of Romans, it's very systematic. It's very like chapter one, this is what we're talking about. Chapter two, this is what we're talking about. Each point builds on the other, and it's a really, really good and easy flowing document to, to follow. In, in fact, if you're starting to take notes, and I hope that you are, uh, out there, because this is really going to help you, especially in this study. One of the ways that a lot of people end up uh, getting, uh, I guess, shipwrecked a bit in their study of Hebrews, particularly some of the more controversial passages we find in here, is a failure to understand a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, there are three points of emphasis that we're going to see in the book of Hebrews. You, you can outline it in three points, and since I'm a classically seminary trained uh, sermonizer. I love three points in a cloud of dust. So, But there are three points in the book of Hebrews, three huge questions that are going to be answered that every believer in Christ, not just uh, this Jewish group that we are referring to here, but every believer in Christ really needs to wrestle through. Number one, who is Jesus? That's going to be the first subject, and the, roughly the first four chapters of Hebrews are going to be devoted to who Jesus is. Uh, is he God? 
You know, why should we pay attention to Jesus rather than, say, uh, Moses or rather than Joshua? What, you know, again, what does Jesus have to offer us that would, we should pay attention to him? Secondly, we're going to see not just who Jesus is in this book, but we're also going to see what Jesus has done for us. The ministry of Jesus is going to be portrayed. And boy, if you've ever wondered why so much of the Bible is devoted, say, to temple sacrifices and so on. If uh, I, I've shared before, I, I remember the first time I ever read the Bible uh, was in a hotel room. We were staying uh, on a family vacation. We were in Utah, and, and uh, I, I'd heard that there were flying saucers in the Bible. And, and so I wanted to find out if that was really so, and they said it was in the book of Ezekiel. So the first passage of the Bible I ever read was Ezekiel chapter 1. And, you know, that's a pretty heavy place to dive in. So I thought, whoa, this is really weird. So I thought, well, maybe I'll start at the beginning and it'll make more sense. And, you know, you read the beginning and heavens and earth and, and you know, it seems to flow along. And suddenly you've got a few genealogies showing. And, oh, well, let's skip ahead. And before too long, you've got some guy throwing a kidney up in the air and all these weird rituals and, you know, why you can't have clothing made out of two different fabrics. Of course, that would have saved us all from polyester, you know. So that was <laughs> kind of prophetic. But, you know, I, I looked at all of this and I just closed the book and I was like, you know, how does anybody get anything out of this? But when you go through the book of Hebrews, you discover that the rituals that we find there, especially temple worship, were such a beautiful foreshadowing of the sacrifice that Jesus would make for our sins. And there's a vividness and there's a richness that you'll find in the book of Hebrews if you've got a little bit of that Old Testament background, which is awesome. But if you don't have that kind of Old Testament background, I'm praying that this will be one of those horse salting sessions for you. You know, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make him drink, but you can salt the horse, right? You can make the horse thirsty and want to drink. I hope this is going to be a salting issue for you because the more you see the beautiful way that temple ritual and sacrifice is fulfilled in Jesus as it's portrayed in this book, you're, you're going to get excited about exploring a lot of that yourself. So hopefully that's going to be a launch point for you. So who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and then the ultimate question that any pastor always fears after a service. So what? What difference does any of this make? You know, what does this have to do with the price of tea in China? Well, there's a huge so what as far as understanding who Jesus is and what he's done and the impact that understanding those two truths are going to make upon our lives. And the writer of Hebrews, I want to say Paul, you know, we'll, we'll defer back to, to that. Uh, you know, he's going to emphasize that understanding these truths is going to change your life, it's going to change the way that you live in some very practical and very measurable ways. So we're excited about that. The other thing that we have to understand before we even launch into the first word here is this. Who's being written to here? Who is the audience that's being addressed? As you mentioned, Peter, it was a group of individuals that was kind of a mixed bag. Uh, you, you really have three kinds of people that are being addressed. It was written, obviously, to a Jewish community. It was written to a group that was largely, if not entirely, Jewish in their orientation. There were three different kinds of Jewish people that are being addressed here in Hebrews. Number one uh, being addressed were, I guess, what we could call the clueless. Individuals that just really had no idea who Jesus is or what he had done. And they needed to find out what was going on. Secondly, uh, there were going to be the uncommitted there were individuals who were like, well, you know, I kind of bought the idea that Jesus was the Messiah, but now it's starting to cost me something, and I, it'll be just much easier to go, oh, Jesus who? I'm just going back to the temple. Those kind of uncommitted people are going to be addressed. And finally, those who are committed are going to be addressed, and they're going to be you know, encouraged in their walk with God. So, you know, as we often say around here, uh, second, uh, first Corinthians chapter 14 and verse three speaks about the unmistakable signs of Bible prophecy. When a prophetic word goes forth, how do you know that you've really heard from God? Three things are going to be true. Paul said, everyone who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and comfort. Now in Hebrews, the people who are clueless are going to get edified. They're going to get the facts about Jesus. 
the individuals that need a uh, push to say, no, you know, you've rejected Jesus, you need to do a 180, you need to turn back to him, they're going to get exhorted. And those who had given their lives to Jesus and were walking with him, but were feeling pretty shaky on their feet, they're going to be comforted, they're going to say, hey, keep on keeping on, uh, you know, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, you're going to see those kind of, uh, of encouragements along the way. And the reason that I mention this is that there are a few landmine passages in the book of Hebrews. If you don't understand this, uh, I've seen some people feel like their faith has kind of gotten blown up uh, by taking a look at a passage and they, they get into spiritual tail chasing and wondering if they're really saved or not. Uh, if you understand that background and can look at some of these passages through that particular lens, as, you, as you're going to see, it really does produce some amazing clarity for us there. So um, having said all of that, have, have we backgrounded this to death, or is there anything else we need to mention? <laughs> no, I think we're good. I think we're ready to launch in. Me and Scott, we're talking in the hall. We don't think we're going to make it past the first three verses. So let, I'm going to just start there. I'm just going to read three, and we'll see if we make it past three. We might get to four. We might get to verse four, but we'll see. Uh, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir to all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had, uh, had by himself purged our sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So right off the bat, this uh, beginning is so deep. Just the, ver the first verse is incredible because what it shows, and it, it, it addresses something that bothers a lot of people. Why is it that God expects me to read this old a book from antiquity why doesn't he just talk to me personally? Why doesn't he just come to me and say, Peter, this is what I'm like, right? And just reveal himself in all of his glory and tell me exactly what's going on. What the writer of Hebrews is getting at is God is a particular mode of revelation, right? And this mode began, he says, in the beginning, right? At various times and in various ways, which is kind of a play on the Greek language. It's uh, polytropos and polymoros. And what he's saying is that, there's various times could also be translated, by the way, piecemeal. So he's saying that God has in pieces at various times revealed parts of himself to people and at various times, meaning he's chosen particular uh, historic events to do these things, to make these revelatory things apparent to his people. And he's utilized the prophets as his spokesperson, meaning that he didn't just go to the nation of Israel and just say, like, this is everything about me. He went to Moses and revealed things to Moses. And Moses then took that revelation and he passed it to his people. Um, is there anything you want to say about that before we move into? Well, you know, when you use the term piecemeal, maybe uh, this illustration will help you a little bit as far as how God revealed himself. I, I don't know how many of you enjoy doing jigsaw puzzles. You know, usually uh, when you go on a vacation to some cabin or down to the ocean, you know, the, inevitably there's a card table with the jigsaw puzzle on it. And, and some people just really kind of make it their goal to, you know, put all 8,000 pieces together and, and, and so on. And, and they find that amusing. It kind of gives me a headache. But, uh, but when you do a jigsaw puzzle, you know, usually the, the methodology behind it is you start by doing the outside. You know, it's easy to find those, those, those outside flat and corner pieces, and you get that outside, and then you start filling in more and more, and you kind of keep looking back to that picture again and again. When and it says, you know, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, it was as if God was saying, okay, Here's the frame. Here's the outline. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and so on. We get the, uh, the picture in Genesis of how uh, God created us, that there is a God, that he has a purpose behind his creation, that uh, we are in the mess that we're in uh, because we have fallen out of relationship with him and that everything that goes on uh, in this world can be explained uh, by God's rescue mission, if you will. This planet's the Titanic going down and, and God is, is about the business of doing that. 
but in bits and pieces and in and, and various times, you know, with various individuals and the different prophets that were raised up. You know, some people say, well, why are there like 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament? Well, they might be minor in the sense of compared to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but they're major in the message that they're sharing. And, and as you begin to understand the whole flow of that, you know, you begin to see what the image is in the puzzle. And if you are doing the puzzle correctly and you put the pieces together, guess what the image is? It's Jesus. That's what it's all about. And, uh, and then, then it, it flows into that conclusion there. That's right. And I, I love that image because when he says how he has uh, spoken in these last days by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and he goes on from there. What Scott's laying out is that the Old Testament essentially is the outline, what the Jewish people were to be expecting from God. Because if you read through the Old Testament, it kind of ends very anticlimactically, right? There's these prophets, Israel's in exile, and there's this promise, right, of a new covenant, Jeremiah 31, in Ezekiel, and in various other places. There's a promise of a new covenant, a new relationship that God's going to have with his people. They didn't know how it was going to happen. They just knew it was going to happen, and then the, it just ends. And you get this beautiful outline of what God has been doing with humanity in the beginning, what he's done with people in an individual relationship basis through his people in Israel, and what he intends to do with all peoples through this new covenant. And then when Jesus comes on the scene, the picture is filled out. Right. It's completed, right? So we had this outline, and now we have this beautiful picture. But because we have the picture, it doesn't mean we could throw out the outline. We can't just say, like, well, well, now I, I see Jesus, so therefore I could just throw you out just the outline. You just take the card table and dump the whole thing That's over. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's, yeah. you, you need the outline because the outline prepares you for the image. It, it fills out the image of Jesus and what he intends to do. So you see God's plan and his directive in revealing himself to the prophets and then coming and speaking to us through his son. This also explains why there's no more books in the Bible, right? For 1,500 years, God was adding, uh, speaking in various times and in various ways, right? He was filling in the pieces. But then all of a sudden we get to the New Testament and it stops. 2,000 years, God hasn't said anything else. Why? Because once Jesus has come, the fullest picture has been revealed to us and you can't add to it. Right. In other words, what the writer of Hebrews is telling us, which is really interesting about the Bible, by the way, some people believe when they pick up the Bible, they're going to get a lot of commandments. It's like a lot of do's and don'ts, and that's what the Bible is. No, we've already mentioned this before. The Bible is a revelation not of what God wants from us primarily, but it's a revelation of God himself. That's what the Bible is. It's a way for us to know God personally. And so as he's saying, God was kind of speaking to people, and they were speaking to us, and that's great, and there was a good outline— but now God has come, and he's put to rest all the questions we could possibly have about God. In John chapter 1, John makes a similar observation. In John 1 verse 18, he says, no one has seen God at any time, right? No one has seen God at any time. We can't see God. I don't see God. You don't see God. But he says, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has come to make him known. That all the speculations of humanity of what is God really like are put to rest in the person of Jesus Christ. There's no more revelation because God has given us his perfect revelation. You can't get better than the sun. Right. Right? Yeah, and, and you know, oftentimes in our increasingly post-Christian uh, skeptical culture, uh, there was a time where there were certain givens that you would just assume that the average person understood about life and reality, and it was sort of this uh, Christian worldview that we have. Well, it, that has been systematically uh, blown out of the water. Uh, there are so many people that I run into that just really don't have the first clue uh, about God. You know, well, why should I even believe there's a God? You know, it used to be, well, everybody knows there's a God out there, you know, but that's not necessarily the case anymore. I, I love this because the first word in the book of Hebrews is the word God. There's no attempt to prove the existence of God. There's no uh, apologetic. There's no defense, if you will, to this idea that there's a supreme being out there. Now, I think it's really interesting because, you know, you can make some pretty persuasive arguments 
uh, logically, uh, that there is a God out there. People say, well, why? You were formerly an atheist. Why do you believe there's a God? Well, a couple reasons. Number one, when I look around at the creation, I don't see randomness and disorder. Uh, design implies a designer. Uh, explosions in print shops don't make encyclopedias. And, and the more we understand, say, just even the miracle of, the, of DNA in and of itself, and, and the odds against this incredibly complex, uh, uh, overwhelmingly uh, intricate information storage and retrieval system coming into uh, existence by itself, it, it, it just begs the question, you know, that this sort of thing could possibly happen. So I look around, I look at creation, do I see randomness and disorder? Or do I see purpose behind that? Uh, secondly, you know, I look within. You know, we as human beings have this insatiable need uh, for purpose and meaning in our lives. Well, if everything I was taught in my secular education from the get-go, that all we are is a nice roll of some chemical dice, and, uh, you know, I get enough monkeys in a room typing for long enough, they're going to type Shakespeare sooner or later, and I guess the monkeys typed up us. And, and uh, you know, this, this idea that all we are is a little blip uh, in a cold and uncaring universe that is absolutely impersonal, that is eventually going to collapse in and upon itself. You know, we look at that, we hear that, and it sounds very intellectual when some guy with three uh, PhDs after his name wearing a white lab coat is laying on it, or maybe even, you know, a former comedian like Bill Nye, the science guy, is trying to pr pretend like he's a scientist. We go, well, I guess they must know what they're talking about. But there's something in our hearts that rails against that. You know, we have to have a sense of purpose and meaning in our lives. In fact, it even goes deeper. All of us run around with this insatiable hunger and thirst in our hearts and our lives for unconditional love and acceptance. Where have we ever found unconditional love and acceptance? I, I saw a commercial on TV not long ago where this woman is holding her cat and says, I love my kitty because my kitty loves me unconditionally. And I said, don't feed kitty for three days and we'll see how unconditional that love really is. And I speak that as someone likes cats. But, uh, but I, I know how they operate. And, and yet we're hungering and thirsting for something we've never experienced. You know, we love people who love us back. We love people who make us feel good. You know, we don't love people unconditionally, and yet we have this overwhelming hunger and thirst for that. Where does that come from? It comes from being made in the image and likeness of a purposeful and passionate creator who loves us, and, and we can't get away from it. Okay, so those are two great reasons. But the best reason of all is right here in the book of Hebrews. Notice it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Now, that's the kicker for me. We're a visited planet, gang. Not by robot Amazons from the planet Stinky Pinky, but by God himself. God walked among us in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and, and Peter, how is Jesus then described by the writer of Hebrews? Some really heavy-duty descriptions of who Jesus is are laid out for us. Yeah, yeah incredible descriptions. Um, by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all the words by the word of his power, I mean, all, um, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So a couple things to pull out from this. These are incredibly churchy things to say. And it's very easy to gloss over and be like, I get it, Jesus is awesome. And yeah. you're right. And, and in seven different ways, <laughs> right. he's described as being awesome in this passage. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. correct. So yeah. I think it's good that we take some time and look at what is so special about this. The first thing he says about him, which I think is really interesting. So you would, you would expect this to go in order of importance. And if you think about the order of importance, it would probably be creation. He made the worlds and being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. That seems like the most impressive things about Jesus. But he doesn't begin there. He begins with, he has appointed heir of all things. Now, th this idea of Jesus being an heir to the creation is really interesting, right? Because Jesus, by rights, 
should have the creation because he's the creator. He's God. What him being the heir signifies, and he gets into this with these Old Testament passages that we're probably going to get into next week, is that there was a humility in Jesus that caused him to lower himself, to empty himself, as Philippians 2 would say it, empty himself of his glory and to become like one of us, a human being. And that through becoming a human being and dying our behalf, living the life that we ought to have lived and didn't, dying the death that we should have definitely died because of what we have done, he has ascended and become an heir, right? Given over his rights and accepted instead this position as being an heir. Now, here's the beautiful thing about that. Because Jesus is an heir, guess what? We are heirs. Right. We are heirs with Christ. This is why Jesus says in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for you will what? Inherit the world, right? In the kingdom of heaven and the, in the world, yeah. throughout the Beatitudes. Right? So there's this idea that Jesus lowering himself and becoming an heir with us has given glory to man as well as to himself, which is an incredibly beautiful thing. So the first thing he talks about is Jesus' character, that Jesus has a humble and beautiful character that is salvific for humanity. It's something that brings us out of our state and into glory. Then he gets into the the more pronounced parts about Jesus, right? Um, He made the world, right? He made everything. He's the creator, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. What this refers to of is, again, something that John has, has gotten into and in other uh, biblical authors. What this means is that, like they've said, no one has seen God at any time, but the glory of God, which is the beauty or his majesty, and his image, which is uh, in the Greek is the word character, and it, it referred to like uh, having a signet ring and stamping it in wax, and that image that you leave behind is a perfect representation of what was on your ring. So he's saying that Jesus, although we can't see God, he is the physical representation of God, if you want to think of it that way. He is the God that we can see and understand. He is the representation of God that, he, that God has given to us that humanity could receive. Because if God actually showed up in all of his glory, he would just melt the earth, right? We yeah. would all just be yeah. destroyed. Yeah. So God wraps himself, lowers himself, into an image that we can see while never substituting the actual importance of himself, which would be his character, his love, and his goodness, never emptying himself of those things, but emptying himself of his grandeur and his glory, he has revealed himself to us. That's the purpose of the Son. That's what Jesus does in the role as the Son. And then he says, upholding all things by the word of his power, Again, pretty impressive. There are things we could say about that. Uh, yeah, well, just in a nutshell, notice it says upholding all things by his power. Um, physicists will tell you uh, that uh, we have a huge problem understanding the basic building blocks of uh, reality, atoms. Because if you had basic uh, grade school science, you learned about atoms, that they have uh, protons and neutrons and electrons, and a proton is a particle with a positive charge, and a neutron is a particle with a negative charge, and electron, or I should say an electron is uh, one with a negative charge, and a neutron is one with a, with a neutral charge. But if you have more than one proton, if you ever tried that deal where you took uh, a magnet and uh, you took the positive ends and you tried to stick them together, you'd find that there was this invisible force that was pushing them apart. Well, that's true in every atom of the universe. Uh, in theory, uh, these atoms shouldn't hold together. And science will say, well, they hold together because there's a thing called nuclear glue that holds them together. And you go, what's nuclear glue? And they go, we have no idea. But it, it must. It, it's like asking science, what's gravity? They, they don't know. It just is. Uh, you know, and, and, and so they, they have to incorporate that into their system to understand this. Here we see what's holding the whole universe together. And it's interesting that the language here is not that he upheld in the past all things by his Lord. We created everything, boom. No, it says he's upholding all things. In other words, God is so intensely, immensely invested in the creation. He is so intensely, immensely 
invested in you and me. You've probably heard the scripture quoted before that God knows the hairs on your head. And since me, with me, that's a constantly changing number. You must be paying attention. But, but let's go even more micro on that. Do you realize that every atom that makes up your body is held together by Jesus Christ? That's why you exist. Because he is upholding you right now individually and personally. And the reason I bring that up is sometimes people will say, oh, you know, I got, you know, all these problems, but, you know, God's so great and he's so out there. How could he care about little old me? Well, when I, I hear things like this, I'll ask them, do you think there's anything too great for God to do? And people will go, well, no, you know, he created the heavens and the earth. You know, he can do it. Yeah, that, yeah, that's true. Well, if there's nothing too great for God to do, do you suppose there's anything too small for God to do? Uh, you think, you know, well, no. And I go, well, then he can certainly take care of a small little thing like you and me, right? He's literally holding every atom, not just of the stars and the galaxies, the wonders we see out there. He is holding you and me together. And not just on a subatomic level. He's holding us together in an intensely personal level. The only reason you and I can make it through a day is because Jesus is upholding us by the word of his power. And that, that's the staggering idea behind it. It's a constant investment that God has with his people. Yeah, absolutely. And then these final things. Um, <clears throat> upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So, again, if you want to read this on your own time, uh, a lot of the stuff being said in Hebrews 1, this, this little uh, prologue, if you will, to the book as a whole, sounds a lot like the Carmen Christi recorded for us in Philippians chapter 2. So if you want to read that section for yourself on your own time and compare it to this, it's very, very amazing. The parallels are very incredible. But, again, it's getting into this idea of Jesus' ministry. And if you look at it, Another cool thing about it is that uh, little formula that Scott gave at the beginning of the three parts of Hebrews, it's in this, if you guys didn't notice, right? Who God is, right? It, it talks about Jesus and who he is, what he's done and what he's doing, upholding us by the word of his power, purging our sins, and so what, right? He goes on to talk about the inheritance that we have with him, right, and being greater than the angels, so the, all three parts are, are placed right there. Now, just uh, one last takeaway that I have of this, which I, I find really, really amazing and incredible. Um, a lot of people will come to me, and I myself have asked these questions many, many times, and I continue to ask them, even though I know the answer. Uh, they'll say something like, I just want to know God's will for my life. Why doesn't God speak to me? Why doesn't God tell me what to do in this particular situation? And we can take that as God not caring right? That we're asking him questions and we're not getting direct answers. So possibly God doesn't care about my situation because he's not telling me what to do. And I'll tell him this because I, I feel pretty confident that you are a lot like me in this. When I evaluate my own heart and I get frustrated to God for not telling me what to do in a particular situation, there are two things that I'm actually saying. Number one, I'm frustrated to God because I want to make a decision without consequences. If God tells me to do something, then I don't have to deal with consequences. I could always just point at God and be like, well, he told me to do it. <laughs> I, I can make this decision be like, well, God told me to do it. Anything that happens as a result or a negative consequence of that decision, God told me to do it. I, I, I didn't have a choice in that. Right? Yeah. Take it up with him. <laughs> yeah. right? If you make a decision and God didn't tell you to do it, guess who has to pay for the consequences? You do, right? God is not a bad parent, right? Bad parents will raise their kids and they will tell them exactly what to do in every circumstance, situation, and they will never give them any authority or power or any amount of wisdom in their life. Those is constantly over rule them helicopter parents. there will be a helicopter yeah. parent yeah. and that kid will grow up but they will not grow up wise they will grow up foolish god doesn't want us to be foolish he wants us to be wise what does it take you as parents you know this what does it take for a child to become wise you set them on a right path you give them good guidance and instruction but you ultimately have to let them make their own decisions right and their own mistakes so they might learn from their decisions and mistakes and therefore gain wisdom. That's what you have to do. God doesn't helicopter parent his children. He doesn't sit around and say, like, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do and when to do it. 
He instead allows us to grow in wisdom. That's why there's an entire book of your Bible called the Proverbs. It's designed to give you wisdom. God wants you to understand that. But another thing that I am saying, essentially why I'm getting so frustrated with God, is because I'm treating God more like an advisor than a God. And this is what I mean by that. When you come to God with problems like this, and there's nothing wrong with doing it, we're supposed to bring our problems to God because he cares about us. We're supposed to ask God for wisdom because he gives to all liberally and without reproach, James 1 tells us. Right? We're supposed to ask God these things. But when we get overly frustrated that God doesn't get us, give us a direct answer exactly when we want it, what it reveals is it reveals that we're looking at God as an advisor. We're saying, here, God, you want to weigh in on this issue? I got this big problem coming up, and I kind of want you to weigh in. And we'll take your input under advisement. And I'll take it under advisement. <laughs> you know, if I like what you have to say, I'll do it. But if I don't like what you have to say, I'll be like, ah, I, I think I ate something funky. I don't know if that was really the Lord. You yeah. know, like I, I have been missing a lot of sleep lately. Who knows if that was God or the Holy Spirit? It could have just been me, you know, and, and we'll make excuses about why not to believe it. But here's the thing. What the writer of Hebrews is getting at when he's talking about God speaking, God speaking, the important thing about listening to the word of God and the importance of what we get from his scripture is we get God. We get him. We get Jesus. We get more of a revelation of who he is. We understand his character. We draw closer to him and we love him. The whole point of Hebrews is to say, Jesus is supreme. There's nothing better than Jesus. You could take the best things in the world, and these guys are Jewish, and they thought they were some pretty awesome stuff in the Old Testament. He's like, Jesus blows those things out of the water. There is nothing greater than Jesus. If you could get more of Jesus, you've gotten the greatest gift that God could ever give you. So if we look at the revelation that God has given us in his word, and we say, that's great, but I kind of want to know what to do with my finances, God. And we get frustrated. It's because we don't understand the glory that God is revealing to us. Right? There's a beauty in the scriptures. There's a beauty in the word of God that is meant to be unveiled day by day by those who follow the Lord and want to seek him. And the more we understand of God, the more we are shown his glory the more we will be complete. And all the other things in our life, as important as they are, they will be put in proper perspective and they will give, be given their proper place in light of the glory of God, in light of his proper position in the universe, which is the upholder of all things and the creator of all things. Once he's in the right place, everything else falls in the right place. But we got to focus on him first. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Yes. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that, boy, even in these first four verses in Hebrews, so many mind-blowing statements about your reality and who you are. And I just, uh, my heart just leaps when, when I read that when you had purged our sins, you sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as you have by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. The idea that the writer of Hebrews describes you as sitting at the right hand of the Father. You're sitting, Lord. Uh, I just remember earlier uh, studying about how Jewish high priests, how is, there was that, uh, that writing in, in the, the Mishnah, the, the, the writings of the rabbis, where a high priest uh, held a, a huge party because he went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and managed to come out without losing his life. He didn't spend a, a single second more in that Holy of Holies than he had to. But here we see you, Jesus, seated in the heavenly Holy of Holies. Lord, we think of what Romans chapter 8 says. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who will be against us? If he didn't spare his only son but gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him freely Give us all things. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ Jesus who died, furthermore is risen, who is seated at the right hand of God, who will also make intercession for us. What shall separate us from the love of God? Lord, thank you for upholding us molecule by molecule, with your mighty hand and your great power, 
Thank you, Lord, for seeing us through day by day and allowing us to know how invested you are in us personally and how glorious your power is. Lord, we pray we would fall more in love with your son, Jesus. We pray we would appreciate him more as we go through this study and that you would paint that vivid picture. And if there's some pieces in our personal puzzle of you that are still missing, I pray you'd put them into place that we would see you in totality and glory and beauty in your name and for your sake. We praise you, Lord, for this awesome time we have had. In Jesus' name, amen.